Welcome to The Plant Report, a radio show that educates about the green world one plant at a time. The Plant Report is a new educational resource about plants, herbal medicine, ethnobotany, and the human-plant relationship. Listen to our podcast, read our blog, watch our videos, and learn from experts and the plants. The Plant Report is a project of Sustainable World Radio and is hosted by Jill Cloutier. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report because every plant has a story. Our plant today is Spilanthes and our guest is Javin Bernakovich. Javin is a regenerative land designer, educator, and facilitator. Javin founded and operates Permaculture BC, an educational and community hub for permaculture in British Columbia, Canada. Javin is the principal consultant at All Points Land Design, where he works on small to large scale landscapes. Javin also works with individual clients, providing assistance on how to design their lives to work with and not against their nature. You can find out more about Javin online at permaculturebc.com and allpointsdesign.ca. Welcome to the Plant Report, Javin. I'm so happy to be speaking with you today. Jill, thank you so much for the invitation. Oh, it's great to have you here. I've been really excited about this interview for a few weeks now um, because we're going to be chatting about one of my favorite plants, which many people haven't heard of. It's Spilanthes. I've also heard some people say Spilanthus. Um, I've heard many different ways to pronounce it, but just so we're all on the same plant page, Javin, could you please share the Latin name of this plant? Yeah, it's Acmella oleraceae. And sometimes uh, before RL uh, changed and, and, and really, uh, pardon me, R.K. Jensen really came up with the binomial, it was sometimes known as Spilanthes um, acmella. But right now, commonly, you'll, you'll have acmella oleraceae across. So A-C-M-E-L-L-A-O-L-E-R-A-C-E-A. Great. Thanks, Javin. That's good. So we're, we all know what plant we're talking about. Because as you probably know, and what I've discovered this week is that Spilanthes has a multitude of common names, many of which allude to its more interesting properties, which we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, and some of the names that I read about um, were toothache plant, electric daisy, eyeball plant, paracress, lemon drop, and my all-time favorite was Michael Polarski's um, name for Spilanthes, which is party in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Scooter would call it party in the mouth. Of course he would. Of course. We'll be talking about what happens when we eat this plant, um, but first thing I just wanted to point out to listeners and to you that I didn't know that um, what, before I um, scheduled this with you, this interview, I didn't know that Spilanthes was one of your favorite medicinal plants, if not your favorite. And I wanted to share with listeners a social media post that you shared online where you wrote, quote, happiness is approximately 225 Spilanthes seedlings. Who knew? End quote. So, Javin, it sounds like you really love this plant, and I'm wondering if you can tell our listeners why Spilanthes makes you so happy, and what is it about this plant that you just really love? Uh, I'm so glad you found that post, and my my uh, freaky-deaky nature about Spilanthes is now well-known across the airways. So can you tell us, Javin, why you're such a fan of Spilanthes? Yeah, I have I have a great love of this plant, and it's due in part to two mentors. the The first mentor was the gentleman who was one of the main instructors in my original permaculture design certificate course, which uh, really launched me into the world of uh, land based ecology living. Uh, his name's Brandon Bauer, and he had this wonderful way about him. He was and is a repository of information when it comes to plants, when it comes to gardening, when it comes to farming, when it comes to regenerative living. And he said, listen, there's there's too many plants in the world for you to think that you can learn them all. And if you bring your Western civilized mind and your Western educated mind to it, you're going to think, oh, there's too much to learn. So just date a plant every year 
And if it goes well, go <laughs> steady and maybe you'll fall in love with it. And uh, for me, that was a great way to, to go about it. And I've done it with food plants. I've done it with perennials. I've done it with um, flowers and ornamentals. But when I started, I took a harrowing trip through the Canadian winter. It was like minus 30. The, the roads were terrible. We were in a, a, a front wheel drive sedan. We went through the mountain passes. It was like a nine hour journey from where we were on Vancouver Island on the western coast of British Columbia, Canada. And we drove all the way inland to a clear sky meditation retreat to go and take a food forestry workshop with Richard Walker. And when we got there, it was just like so many of those workshops, you just come into this amazing group of people that are just like you. They're as geeky as you. They get excited about plants like you. And Richard had years and decades of experience with splanthes. And he told us stories and he told us about them. He gave us some splanthes tincture. And I thought, this is a plant I want to start dating. And so I'll say that for the last decade, I've had truly a love affair with this plant and really culminated last year when I was able to cultivate the beginnings of how much I want to cultivate. I can see myself cultivating potentially a commercial scale crop at some point because there is so much potential with this plant and it's, it, it is a must have in my first aid kit. The reason that I originally reached out to you on Facebook was that um, I saw a post where you were talking about Spilanthes tincture, you were making it, and some of the results that you've gotten from going steady with Spilanthes. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to hear about that. So can you um, tell us a bit about how you've incorporated this plant into your life? And then we'll start talking about the medicinal qualities and all of that. But first, can you share with listeners, how do you usually utilize Spilanthes? So for the last, I would say five years, there has never been a time when I have been out of Spilanthes tincture. I have had Spilanthes tincture on hand for the last five years without fail. It is uh, usually a heroic in that if I'm traveling, if I'm feeling sick, if I have any sort of tooth pain, or if there's any question about uh, immunological effects or immunological um, defense, I will start taking it in, uh, in quantity. So it's been with me now for, for five years. And just this week, I was having a little bit of a, a tooth thing, took two or three, uh, two or three, you know, full shot glasses, uh, throughout the day, swished as long as I could, because <laughs> that's really where you're, you're extracting as much of that spilanthanol into your gums, calling forth the white blood cells, spit it out, then take about, you know, half a half an ounce or a quarter ounce just internally. So just swish it back or let it stay on the tongue. And I use it uh, without fail during the winter, during the summer, the moment those buds start to become active, I'm, I'm eating it in the garden. <laughs> I'm, I'm eating like five, 10, 15, 20 buds. Uh, throughout the day, just because it's so much fun to be in the garden and to get this nine volt battery on your tongue <laughs> from this little plant. And it's, it's, it's an amazing little addition to the day. It has no uh, psychedelic or psychotropic effects. It's, it's just an incredible immune support. And, you know, there's, there's so many different areas that it has been researched into. There's just, it's like antibacterial, antifungal, gastroprotective, uh, analgesic, antioxidant, fl uh, flavor enhancing, anti-obesity. It has testosterone effects. It has lubricating effects. It's, it's just, the list is so long that now that I've even done more research over the last couple of years, there's no way I would never not grow this plant. You know, it's, it's perennial in zones 10 to 11. It's annual from zones two to nine. There's really no place you can't grow it. The one hiccup with splanthes is if you don't get intense heat for at least four or five days, it won't turn over its splanthanol productivity and you'll have a nice looking plant, a plant you can use in food, but it's not necessarily going to have the constituent to really give it that punch. Yeah, that, that's one thing I want to talk to you about. But before we start going into more specifics, um, 
about that. Can you describe, Javin, to listeners? So say you have your Spilanthes plant. You're eating the flower, that the flower head, right? And <laughs> you beat me, Javin. I can only eat one at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's like oh my god I only ate the whole flower after I read um something you wrote about it before I would just take like a teeny tiny nibble off the side and it was like oh my god whoa this mm. is so intense um but then I read your post and I thought I'm gonna be brave and I bit off the whole flower head and I'm always so sorry I'm like sorry plant <laughs> bite. Um, but what happens when we chew the flower? Can you describe it in the best way you can to listeners? It is a little bit hard to describe, I think. Yeah, I'll <laughs> I'll describe the uh, low dose okay. and then I'll, I'll, I'll give right off the bat the cautionary tale because you can yes. take too much. Um, so for me, when I'm taking tincture or when I'm taking uh, the bud and eating the bud, uh, it really does feel like when I was a kid and put a nine volt battery on my tongue, but it feels like that anywhere in the mucus uh, lining of my mouth. So my tongue, my gums, uh, my the inside of my lips, the inside of my cheeks, basically anywhere where there is that, that mucus lining there is an incredible buzzing sensation, an electric sensation. Almost immediately, there's an overproduction of saliva. Um, and there tends to, for those that are sensitive enough, there tends to be a draining effect. There tends to be a, a sinus draining effect. And what's so interesting is that I've trained myself over 10 years of taking this plant that when I talk about spilanthes, I actually get more saliva in my mouth. It happens every single time I talk about it. Well, you can feel it, right? You can almost feel it in your mouth. <laughs> you really can. I have a little flower that I picked before the interview and just looking at it, you would never know. It's so adorable. You'd never know that it packs such a punch. Right, right. Yeah, the spot flower. Because mm -hmm. um, that's where it comes from, right? Uh, spilos is Greek for spot. And mm -hmm. so that's where that spilanthes comes from, the spot flower. Let's get back to your mouth. And so I'm curious um, if you could describe it a little bit more, what the sensation is. Um, I think your mucous membranes can start tingling. And do you find that it can make you feel a little woozy, like this is a little too much? No, not me, but I have given it to enough people that yes, uh, there's there's a number of people to whom the effects of spilanthes are too much. And mm -hmm. so I usually, when I'm showing somebody uh, it new and I don't have tincture because of course you can water down tincture. You can give them a little, if I'm just using the bud, I'll usually break it apart, which is incredible because the inside of the, the bud is so beautiful uh, and break it apart again and give them usually an eighth of a quarter. So I just, I give them that eighth, uh, I give them an eighth, not an eighth of a quarter, but I give them half of a quarter, an eighth and let them chew it. And usually get, give them the experience of just a little bit of it, not too much, but it can overpower, it can tap into the uh, autonomic nervous system, it can make people feel lightheaded, it can make people lose their center of balance. Um, I found that particularly with um, slight women, with women who are, who are uh, they don't have a lot of weight to them, they're, they're quite small or petite. Um, it can really overpower them to the point to where on the other side, which is when I will take you know, four or five buds, you can get to a point to where it feels like you can't breathe with it or there's so much saliva and now there's your nose is starting to drip and your eyes are starting to water. So it really is one of those things as is with all plants, especially medicinal plants, You know, take a little bit, see how it tastes and then move up to the point to where you feel that you're still comfortable but getting the effect, but it can go into that extreme situation. Javin, I think that's a super good point that you bring up is that, like with all plants, I had um, this belief, especially in my 20s, where I just thought, oh, this is natural, so it's good for me. <laughs> so I think it's important to learn and to be more mindful, to try a little bit, see how our bodies react, because all of our bodies will react a little differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so for your horror story, well, not horror story, your cautionary <laughs> tale, um, did something happen to one of your friends with Spilanthes? Right. So, uh, yeah, so a couple of stories. First story is uh, uh, I, was, I was visiting friends and I was, I was good friends with, with both of this couple. 
and he had taken Spilanthes before quite a bit. And he was like, oh, I love this. And I brought him some buds and he had them and he gave it to his girlfriend who is a, is, is, is a slight petite woman. And she took the bud and she couldn't breathe. She was tearing up. You know, she was in a panic state. She was in a shock state. She was thinking she was fighting for her life. Um, so it can really go to that extreme. It, it can really create quite a bit of distress. I have never heard of anybody actually getting to the place where um, they had any uh, prolonged issues. Uh, pretty much every story I've ever heard, there's uh, the, the effects have subsided within 10 minutes. They've gone back to being able to breathe. They've gone back to being able to, to feel um, alive, as many people say when they take too much, as I have done. I have taken four or five buds, not been able to breathe, thinking this is my last great experiment. This was a dumb move, uh, but it I've never had it not subside. But that being said, you know, be careful, do your due diligence, take a little bit, take a little bit more, see how you feel. Don't go out and put four or five buds during the height of summer into your mouth. I don't either. You know, I'll, I'll eat one and then I'll have it in my mouth and I'll be chewing it and chewing it and chewing it. And then you know, I'll go back and pick another good bud and go back and do uh, continue on with what I'm doing. But it's, it's not necessary to go to that extreme unless you're like me and I have to figure out <laughs> where, my, where my boundaries are. I guess you don't want to be using this plant as a party trick and that it's a good reminder to be mindful and respect it. Um, and I wouldn't imagine that Spilanthes would have that many um, insect pests due to this property, this impact that it can have. Yeah, very few, very few. Mm -hmm. Slugs will devour it early in the season uh, because, again, you have to get that heat wave to get the constituent in. And I have found that if you understory it, so I had, I did a number of experiments this summer and one of them was I understoried splanthes with kale. So the kale was growing over top, the splanthes was below. And as we know, with understoring, you increase humidity. And I found that that had two profound effects. One, I had a snap freeze September 8th and I lost about 60% of my crop but the crop that was underneath the kale was great. However, that humidity really attracted aphids, which attracted ants, and the spilanthes was covered with aphids and ants, which really, it just becomes a, a, a that's now just a plant that's producing exudates for the soil food web, because I'm not gonna pick those buds, I'm not gonna turn that into tincture. Uh, but that was a really good lesson this year. Uh, I, will, I will not understory them again in humid environments. Certain plants. So I had a couple of plants that had super high levels of it. Um, is it spilanthol? Spilanthanol, yep. Well, I think that's what affects the heat. Well, it's not even the heat, right? It's more the tingle. So does growing it as an understory plant affect the levels of spilanthanol um, of that phytochemical? Or is it more sun or more heat? Yeah, it's an interesting conversation, and and I've looked through I've looked through all the literature, and as usual, uh, anything that has to do with human uh, enhancement or productivity or biohacking, we know about, but we don't really know what the conditions are. I, I I just know that if if we're hot and sunny, we're going to get uh, a big boost. And what I found with those plants is because I was harvesting uh, the kale, and the kale was umbrellaing, and then I was I was harvesting and then it came back and I was umbrelling again. Um, it had good sunlight. It had then some shade. It had, and I, I didn't find a difference between the constituent level between that and the ones that were in full sun. So I would say it's, it's pretty much the same. So it's the heat. It sounds like they really need heat. Yes. I believe that you've had really excellent results using Spilanthes for oral health. Can you tell our listeners a bit about that? Oh, for sure. So not only have I had good experience, but also my mentor, Richard Walker, who's a master herbalist, similarly has had phenomenal results. So, so the first story I ever heard from Richard was that he had a client who came to him and her doctor said, listen, we're going to have to pull all of your teeth. They're all rotted. There's no way we're going to be able to bring them back. 
And she had heard about this food forester on the edge of town. And so she came in and she's like, listen, here's the deal. I'm willing to try anything. I, I don't want to go to dentures. And so he gave her, I think it was a liter or a liter and a half of tincture. And she used it as a mouthwash three times a day, just mouthwash, mouthwash, mouthwash. And at the end of, I believe it was a three month period, she saved all of her teeth except for two. There was wow. two that were totally rotted that they absolutely had to pull, but every other tooth came back and was able to reassert itself into her mouth as, uh, as an entire ecology, as an entire ecosystem. So it started with that. And then he then had a, a dentist call him up from, I think it was Calgary, Calgary, Alberta, just the province east of me here in British Columbia and said, listen, I've heard about Spilanthes. I've had some, some clients of mine that were clients of yours. I'd like to, I'd like to, to buy everything he got. And so he bought them out and he ended up using it and he measured the gum improvement. So a 0.3 millimeter uh, increase in gums is hailed as a miracle in the dentist world. And individuals were having a three millimeter improvement or more. They were getting massive results with, with gum coming back, with gum disease, with gum decays, with abscess, with sores. And so that really turned me on to using it for myself. So for the last 10 years, I haven't been to a dentist and I have only, well, I have three tools in my, in my dental hygiene box. I've got brushing my teeth, I've got toothpicks and I've got spilanthes and the teeth that might have started to, and I do, I have, I've got a few teeth that have a little hole in them, but there's no problem with them. It's healed. It's healed up. It's totally fine. And then this year, I sold uh, tincture. I had one client who ended up uh, taking care of their gum disease for the first time in 20 years. I had another client who had an abscess for, I think she said that she'd had it for about nine months and uh, modern medicine couldn't touch it. Uh, penicillin couldn't touch it. Steroids couldn't touch it. But in a week of using the Splanthes tincture I created, uh, it was gone. So across the board, folks have, been reporting really good results with it. That is really impressive and so helpful because dentists often say that once your gums have receded or are at a certain point, it's irreversible. Yeah, that's pure poppycock. I think uh, unless somebody moves outside of allopathic medicine, uh, they're always going to get the allopathic history. And allopathic history is a couple of hundred years old, yet plants and humans have had relationships for at least two and a half million years in terms of what works for us, what works uh, within that relationship. And I think it's really important for everyone to remember that. Absolutely. If I have a heart attack, if I have an appendix burst, if I have a broken leg, if I'm in a car accident, take me to the hospital. I do not want aromatherapy, but thank you. But on the daily, how we keep in good health, how we promote ourselves in good health, there are so many plant allies. There are so many fungal allies. There are so many allies within ecology. It really behooves all of us not to take any doctor, dentist, allopathic professional at first glance, because chances are they've had what they call best practices, which again, best practices are outdated at least by the time you hear them being called best practices, because they're a couple years old, life's moved on. And it's really important to have a holistic sense when it comes to our health. Javin, that really fits in with some of the other work that you do in helping people design their lives. And I really was struck by how hmm. you are growing your own medicine, which to me is really empowering and, and it's taking back that power. Um, it invigorates me when I can do the same. And I think, I, I just think it's really great. Yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, sovereignty is this thing that is delicious and inviting and incredibly empowering. When we are the creators and the created of our situation, there's a power there that modern society has removed from us. Now there's lots of conveniences, don't get me wrong, I love using a calculator, but when you have the ability to calculate a formula on your own, when you have the ability to grow your own food, when you have the ability to take care of your own needs, you're the creator and the created of your situation instead of what I think the, the modern mainstream narrative is, which is, oh, you're just created by your situation. You just have to be the recipient when for at least since we've been genetically stable as homo sapiens, we have been individuals that have taken care of our own needs, have been responsible for our own needs. And that reminder, I think, needs to be 
daily because so many stories, so many narratives in modern society are, you can't take care of yourself and we can. One thing that came up for me, Javin, in researching this is that Spilanthes um, has potential in stimulating mm. taste changes. And so I wonder, do you think that there might be potential in Spilanthes helping with COVID-related loss of taste? A hundred percent. We've had uh, individuals, family members who've been taking Spilanthes after COVID and have really helped with taste come back. So a hundred percent. I've, I've seen it firsthand. I've experienced it with, uh, individuals that are around me and absolutely, I think there's an incredible, uh, adaptogenic aspect to this plant, which I don't think is totally understood, but it has had the ability. And I don't know if it's the flooding of saliva. I don't know if it's the activation of white blood cells to wherever there is splanthanol, but there is something about that, that calls forth, um, that calls forth that element brings it into the mouth, brings it into the tongue, and then just calls forth the, the white blood cells to work on that area. And so if there is some mechanism, whatever that mechanism is that has removed taste in people uh, from, from uh, COVID or otherwise, I think it's a great addition to whatever your recovery is. That is really exciting news. Um... And on the one hand, Spilanthes offers us so much. And then on the other hand, there's a part of me that's a bit hesitant to talk up plants like they're mm. super foods or super mm. plants. We've seen what has happened um, with golden seal and echinacea when a plant gets very, very popular. Um, sometimes it leads to over harvesting and poaching. And so I think mm. it's important if it is possible for people to grow Spilanthes at home that that's a really great thing to do. And I'm curious, mm -hmm. um, and you alluded to this a bit earlier, what does Philanthes need to be happy and healthy? I know we are talking about sun and heat. Mm -hmm. And then another question is, could you grow this plant in a container if you're in an urban setting? Yeah, absolutely. So container gardening with this is no problem. I've done it in, uh, I've done it in planters. I've done it in uh, wicking beds. I've done it in hygge culture. Uh, I've done it indoors. Um, not as successfully, but it really likes being outside. But yeah, absolutely. It, it, loves, um, it loves rich soil. It loves poor soil. Uh, it's, it kind of doesn't care in my experience with soil. It'll grow in whatever way it needs to and um, works really well that way. Um, I find with, with seeding, um, it's a very small seed. So I tend to seed very shallow. So I put it on the surface of my, my seed cells. I use a lot of um, soil blockers just because I like the, the air pruning aspect of soil blockers. So I'll use micro blocks and then I'll move it up to the two inch blocks. Um, uh, I start them up here. I start them about a month or two before spring. Uh, I let them grow nice and big indoors and that way they can take off right away. I've started it outdoors but again, I'm in a zone four, so it's it's a shorter growing cycle. So I like to get them out as soon as possible. I've helped people grow them with polytunnels. So low polytunnels are in greenhouses and they do phenomenally well in the heat. So if you throw a little bit of plastic over them, they really do produce quite well. But generally I leave mine out in the open. And this year what I'll be doing is I'll be... Uh, ready come August for some polytunnels to quickly be thrown over so that way I don't lose them this year. How large do the plants get just um, for those who have never seen Spilanthes before? Yeah, they, they, can, they can get to about, a single plant can get to about a foot wide, you know, 30 centimeters thereabouts. They can get a little larger if they're well fed and they have everything they need. And, you know, about the same high. So yeah, about, a, about 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters or a foot by foot. So say you have your cute little Spilanthes plant that you're going steady with now. And <laughs> <laughs> how do you know when it's time to harvest? Yeah, so harvest is, uh, if, you're, if you're harvesting for a constituent, if you're harvesting for medicinal versus harvesting for the leaves for salads or for uh, stir fries, which you can completely do. You basically just treat it like spinach, which I do over the, the spring and summer. And the family's totally fine with it until it becomes... Um, 
filled with splanthanol. Once it becomes <laughs> splanthanol, they do not like the buzzing in their stir fries and their salads. They're like, but, oh my gosh, you did it again. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, it's here again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I traveled through China for a, a couple of months when I was younger and I just love some of that, that uh, tingling, the anise. I, it's just such a lovely flavor in food. So uh, I really like it. The family doesn't. So it you know, there's, there's Javan salad and Javan stir fry, and then there's everybody else's, but basically as soon as the, the top of the, the bud becomes quite red. And after you've had some heat, I would try a little bit of the bud just to see if it's, if it's active. And then normally I let it go for about a week or two, uh, to get really warm and to make sure that that constituent is, is really quite uh, a lot. And if this is the first time you've grown it, you won't have any metric, but if you're having a hard time keeping it in your mouth uh, and chewing it, chances are you're, you're at a good peak. So I start to pick them pretty much right away um, because as you pick the flowers, it promotes more growth of flowers because there's that life ethic. As soon as a plant feels that it's, um, that it's going to die or it can't reproduce, it'll, it'll do more reproduction. So I pick the flower, the, the plant hormone oxen goes down to the crown. The crown goes, okay, I got it. More flowers on the way, more flowers are produced. And so I'll pick anywhere from um, mid to beginning of August, all the way into September and October, just trying to really you know get as much of that bud as I can. Cause it is a prolific plant. You can get upwards of 30 or 40 buds if you do this type of cut and come again uh, on a single plant. Oh my gosh, you just alleviated my guilt over chomping on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No worries. And so you're harvesting your buds and if you're lucky, you get 30 to 40. And I'm curious, what's the best way um, to use them? Mm. And do you dry them? Do you use them fresh? How do you proceed after that? Yeah. So there's a couple of ways of using it. Uh, I like fresh eating. So I usually have a bowl that's in inside that I can munch on or, or the family can, if they're brave, almost never happens, but you know, <laughs> I I'm playing the long game. I'm playing the long game with them. Uh, and then if I'm using, um, if I'm using them for, for tincture, I'll tend to use them fresh and I'll take my gallon Mason jars, um, fill them up. Uh, I fill them up as much as possible. So the formula is the majority of it is bud. You can use a little bit of leaf. The stem has almost no constituent that I've ever experienced. And I've chewed on a fair number of stems just to see. And then a little bit of root. This was from my mentor who really uh, taught me to do, you know, five, 10% of root and, you know, 10 to 15% of, of leaf and then the rest bud. And basically going and packing it as tight as I can up to where you start to get the shoulder of the jar and then leaving about an inch of, of alcohol. And so I use, uh, I think it's 45%. Um, uh, I use six distilled barley alcohol from a local distillery. Uh, and then I'm leaving that for 30, 60, 90 days, usually by 45, you're good. Uh, one thing that's important is that there'll be a protein that's developed, uh, on the bud if you leave it in alcohol for too long. So basically every other day I take it, take it down from its uh, dark and dry place uh, and I shake it, I invert it and really shake it to try and shake off that protein. So that way the alcohol can extract the splanthes. And then when I like it, and I'm, I'm, I'm testing basically at, at day 45, I'm dipping in a spoon, seeing how I like it. Uh, then we go to pressing and you just use uh, a, a press if you have one or cheesecloth and a stick and you just twist it up and you squeeze it all out. Uh, and then you've got your tincture, which again, uh, dry place at 45%, you can keep it forever. I, I have tincture from 2017 that I made that is still very viable. And what's interesting is some of the commercial uh, spilanthes that's out there isn't viable after six months. So that usually means that there was a dilution and I was taught never dilute um, your Spilanthes tincture, just keep it at strength. And it's really served me well. I've got Spilanthes tincture that's now four years old that is still exceptionally potent. That's wonderful. And so with your tincture, you say you're taking it at the first signs of a cold and also using it for your teeth. How would you use it in these instances? Do you actually swallow the tincture or are you just swishing it around in your mouth? 
Yeah. Yeah. Dosage, dosage is always a, an important question because you want to make sure that you're taking the right amount. And there's always, uh, there's always a question of, is there too much? Is there too little? But for dosage, for me, what I do is uh, for, for tooth, gum, mouth inflammation, anything like that, it's a tablespoon three times a day. Um, and I just take it internally. So I'm taking the tablespoon and I'm swallowing it back or holding it uh, under the tongue and then swallowing. For infection, for anything that's, that feels like it needs that extra added dose, um, I'll take two tablespoons or like an ounce, uh, put it into my mouth and swish and gargle until I can't stand it. So swishing and gargling. And then afterwards, I'm, I'm spitting out because if anything's been picked up, if there's any bacteria, if there's anything that that the splanthes is uh, attracted to or connected to, I want to remove that. And if there is something that's painful, if there's something that's open as an open sore, that'll be like anywhere between three to five times a day. And then I'll follow that up with a tablespoon internally. If I'm traveling, if I'm going to hospitals, if I'm going to clinics, anything like that, I'm taking half a, half a tablespoon before entering, during, and when I leave. So I've got a little bottle I have with me when I move move around. And when I work internationally, when, when we went to Kenya to put together this um, Practical Permaculture Institute of Kenya, uh, a, a bunch of my students were like, oh, I want this because I need it in my, my travel. And it was amazing. Half of them who normally got sick when they traveled didn't. So lots of good, uh, lots of good response there. And then the first sign of illness. So uh, headache, uh, sore throat, drippy nose, anything like that. I take a, a tablespoon three times a day. Now, can you take too much? Yeah, if you're nauseated after you've taken it, it's a sign to stop and let your body take a break. Uh, you don't need to have um, don't need to have that. And while I haven't done this, my herbal mentor does recommend it that you keep a tissue or a handkerchief, soak with splanthes, and sniff it to help with airborne pathogens. That was a process he picked up during COVID. And I thought, oh, that's really interesting. I, I live ridiculously isolated anyway. So I haven't had to take that on because normally I'll just throw splanthes in my pocket when I'm going into town for groceries or whatnot. But it's been, it's been really phenomenal that way. And this is the same dosage that was given to everybody this year with their, their tincture. So we know that it's had good effects thus far. Amazing. And so for oral health, is it the same dosage? Yeah, I would say if you've never taken it before, uh, morning and night using it as a mouthwash, that would be fantastic for the first couple of months. At this point, uh, my teeth are so strong and I have such good oral hygiene that I take it maybe once a week if I remember. And I have to say I've fallen off the wagon for sure. Uh, it's normally when I'm reminded of my my teeth, either I've you know bitten down or something or I've got something that's developed in my mouth or what have you, I'll, I'll go back to using it for a little while because that's what humans are. We forget. So, uh, but if I was starting fresh, I would do it morning and night, take a tablespoon, swish it around until you can't anymore, and then come back to it the next day for maybe a week or two and just see how you're doing. Again, if you're feeling nauseated or if you can't stand it, you can always dilute it, right? You can throw in as much water as you need to until you can take it. And that's what uh, my family does. They, they dilute it because it's, it's quite a lot. Yeah, I'm looking at the photo of you on Zoom and your teeth. They look great. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are quite healthy looking, I have to say. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not all straight, but they are very healthy. That's very true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's imagine that we have, are growing our plants and we are making our tinctures. How easy is it to save seed? And do you do so? So years ago, I was introduced to Cosmic Bob's plan for your life. Do you know this? Mm -mm. So the Bullock brothers of permaculture fame on Orcas Island uh, made this character, Cosmic Bob, this, this godlike character. And Cosmic Bob had this five-year plan. And look it up. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And at the end of every year, it was, and save more seed. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I save seed. And basically what I do is as soon as... Um, a bud has gone completely gray. So they'll go yellow, they'll go red, and then they'll go gray. And this, I have to say, uh, there's lots of cultivars of, of splanthes that are won't follow that pattern, the yellow to red. My seed does that. So um, that's my experience. But if you have buds that never turn red, but are still potent, no problem. Don't, don't think you have, uh, uh, you know, there's no splanthes envy. You're okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> but once it's gone gray, um, you can then pick the buds. And then I usually put them out on a drying rack and just let them really dry out. And then it's really easy. It's just uh, in two hands, just back and forth and the seeds will come out. There'll be the flower petals as well. And then there's just a little bit of winnowing and I just use breath because they're very light seeds. I don't, I don't want them to jump from the bowl. Again, winnowing is just uh, ensuring that any of, any of the non-seed parts are moved away from the seed parts. And so I just use a big, uh, metal bowl and I just blow gently over it to get get rid of the the chaff so to speak and then I store my seed either I've done both I've stored my seed in glass jars which I know you're not supposed to do and I've stored them in envelopes and I found no difference between um, between germination I store them in glass jars only because I have a lot of seed and sometimes I'll get an entire you know ma drinking mason jar full uh, but uh, it's such a fun plant to save seed from because it's so easy. Uh, you're right. It is so easy. An herbalist friend gave me um, a bunch of seed flower heads actually four or five years ago. And I, um, they're still viable now. Yeah. And they have almost 100% germination yeah. rate, which is amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing <laughs> that that plant is just like, uh, yes, yeah. I will grow for you. If you just mm -hmm. give me a little bit of love, a little bit of sun, a little bit of water, I'm good. Last summer, I was like the Spilanthes ambassador because um, you know how you overplant, at least I do, overplant seeds, and they all showed up. <laughs> and mm. It was like, hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and so they all came to the mouth party. And so I gave them away. It was great. I gave them to so many yeah. people. Yeah. Javin, have you ever made tea from Spilanthes? You know, I don't make tea. It's, it's supposedly an amazing analgesic. It's supposedly an amazing pain reliever. I've never made the tea. And I think it's due to the fact that I just chew on the buds all summer long. And I've never thought to take a whole plant, dry it out and have it for tea during the winter months. But I'm thinking this next year, or I might even take a bunch of the buds that I have dried from this year and give it a shot. But no, it's just the tincture is so nice. I've got the tea I like to drink. So I've never done it. I actually um, made some a few months ago and it was, it was good. Mm. It was that same tingly quality, just a bit more muted. There you go. I'm curious if there's anything else that you'd like to add about Spilanthes. Yeah, I, I guess I'll add that. I, I'll kind of go patterns to detail. So there's no reason not to grow this or become familiar with Spilanthes. It's especially in, in, in cooler climes, which pretty much all of North America, because it is it is a, a, a native a native plant down from uh, Paraguay and Brazil, you're it's never going to run, it's never going to become invasive, it's never going to become undesirable. It's a beautiful plant. It has a lovely flower to it, a lovely color to it. It has a nice big leaf, has a little bit of a sort of a waxy quality to it, or like a thicker spinach quality. It's good as a green. Um, there's just no reason not to grow this plant and become familiar with it and to have a little bit more resiliency when it comes to your food, to your medicine, and just to your overall food sovereignty and, and health sovereignty as a person. So if I can say anything, it's uh, grow Spilanthes. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. And if you take too many buds, just remember it was you who took too many buds. It wasn't the <laughs> Spilanthes. Don't demonize it. It's a wonderful plant. Oh my gosh. And just, and just sit down before you try it. <laughs> well, it's true. It's true because constitution is different for everybody. So, you know, it's like anything, go slow, take a little bit, see what it's like, take a little bit more, see how you feel. I had uh, an old farmer uh, who's, who's very conventional and he, he was up at my place. He helped drive in the fence post for the garden this year. And he came up, he's like, I, I didn't think you'd have this much success this year. It's like, oh, come try something. Come, come see what this is like. And so I said, here it is. It's like a nine volt battery on your mouth. It's going to feel intense. Just take a little bit. And, you know, old German farmer, and he's like, I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> I want seed. You know, it's, it's uh -huh. a wonderful opportunity because 
so many things in the garden unless they're ripe and ready. You can't really give to, you, you can't give somebody echinacea, you can't give somebody rosemary and they go, oh, my memory's improved. Like there's, there's just nothing that you can have that immediate response. But this is one of those plants where you can get that quick turnaround where people go, oh, I get why somebody would garden. I get why somebody would grow. Like there's, there's that immediate response that I think modern society has desensitized us to anything that takes a little bit of time. It's so much immediate gratification. And that's one of the things I love about Spilanthes is it really meets that modern need to have an immediate response and really see something of value. Yes, it really does. That's so true. And I feel like it's, it's kind of like flowers in the garden and herbs like basil that you brush against. And that strong aroma comes at you. And with Spilanthes, it's an internal, it's an, an internal reaction, but it's so potent and, mm. and wonderful and different. And hopefully listeners will try to grow this plant because it's quite easy and rewarding. Mm -hmm. So Javin, for people who want to experience this plant, I'm wondering if your tincture is available for sale. Yes, uh, the tincture is always available unless it's sold out, but then you can be put on a waiting list. So this year, all of my tincture got sold out because uh, I had a 60% crop loss due to that snap frost. And I've got a list already started for uh, 2021's crop. I'm planting mm, maybe seven times as much as I planted this year. <laughs> You're going to be so happy. I, if I am. 225 is happy. What is that going to be? <laughs> well, uh, it's it's going to be close to uh, 1400 some, somewhere. So you'll be ecstatic. I mean. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I, I imagine at some point the neighborhood is going to find out about it because, you know, you never you never always reach out to the neighbor, but uh, I'll probably start going farther afield. But yes, there is. There is an email list and I'll make sure that I send it over to be in the show notes or something to that effect. Great. That would be great. And how can people find you online? Yeah. So allpointsdesign.ca is my main website. It's where I talk about life and land design. And uh, there's a great mailing list on there. And then if anybody's interested in courses in regenerative living, uh, there's a brand new website called regenerativeliving.online. We have a number of courses from understanding and working with living soil to how to plan source, grow, preserve, and store your food for a year. Uh, new courses about science and agriculture, biochar, you name it. We're building a repository of incredible regenerative living skills on that website. And those are great places to reach out. If you are on Instagram, it's Javin Kirby on Instagram. And if you're on Facebook, uh, Javin Bernakovich, there's only one. <laughs> And so Javin, to close, I'd love to ask, because I know so many people right now who are looking at their lives and reevaluating and deciding what's important and what's not. And I'm just curious because you do work with individuals mm. as well as with plants. Um, and this work that you do sounds fascinating. And I'd love it if we could maybe um, in the future, we can do a podcast episode about that for my other podcast. But right mm. now, I'm just curious if you have any words of wisdom for people who are experiencing a lot of change or looking for some peace of mind or wanting to move forward in the mm. right direction? Yeah, such a great question. Thank you for that. It's, it's a state of being I've come to realize that if you don't design your life, it'll be designed for you and probably already has and probably for somebody else's benefit, not yours. So if there's any element of your life that you haven't actively thought about and said, yeah, I don't know what I think about this, but I'm going to wrestle with it and figure it out. Then you've adopted the patterns, the behaviors, the narratives, the stories of your ancestors, your families, your friends, and you were all exceptionally unique. The atoms that came together to make you have never been together in the history of the universe, and they never will be again. And so who we are as individuals, our mind, our body, our spirit, our emotions, our mentality, all of that is hyper unique. And if we in any way, shape or form take on the designs from somebody else, they're not going to fit you. They're going to fit a little bit. It'll be like putting on a jacket that's a little tight or shoes that are a little big. There's always going to be a bit of tightness or a bit of slop there. And so in my experience, especially when it comes to life, if you haven't thought about what's important to me and not the things, because society and the way that corporate capitalism works, it makes you really interested in things and says, oh, these are your needs and you have to pay to get your needs met. Instead of that, you take a step back and you go, well, 
what are the values that are important to me? Do I want to be healthy? Do I want to have a sense of solace in my work? Do I want to have a sense of uh, reprieve and relaxation at home? And if you hold that as the penultimate goal, that then becomes a filter for bringing along any decision. Any decision you can put up against that filter and say, if I take on this decision, will this other thing be true? So years ago, a friend and colleague of mine, uh, Zach Weiss, who's an incredible designer and has worked with um, a designer named Sepp Holzer in Austria and is his, his, his uh, prodigy, he was looking at potentially buying a piece of land. And so he called me up. He's like, I know you do this. I know you do these single decision sessions. Could we have a chat? And I said, sure. And when he started, he's like, I really want to be into land. Land's really important to me. But again, that's the thing. That's the shiny thing, right? We all have this shiny thing, anitis. It's a terrible affliction where we're all interested in the thing. So we took a step back and I asked him a couple of questions. Like, what's important to you right now? What are the values that you want? What are the main weak links, the things that are not great in your life? And basically it was community and a sense of home. And this was an amazing piece of property. It was in another country. It was a really great price. And as we went through it, that filter of, I want to build community and I want to, I want home. He realized that that specific piece of property wasn't going to be able to, to bring about that sense of community and wasn't going to be able to bring about that sense of home. So even though it was a great price and yeah, he could have hold on to it or yeah, maybe he could have resold it. That all takes time, money, and energy to hold on to something that might produce fruit or labor at a later date. So this process that I start with is this conversation of what are our values and then what are the decisions that come up to it? And then use those values as a filter for anything that you're deciding, what you're going to do, what you're going to be involved in, what the next step of your life is. If you are pivoting like so many people are, I just had a, a phone call conversation with a, a farmer down Texas way where so much has changed in their life recently that they, they're really revamping everything and they want to understand and clarify their values and then make good decisions on their that's always going to be the right time. There's, there's never going to be a bad time to do that. There's going to be a time that there's more time for you or experience or whatever, but there's never a bad time to say what's important to me. And then how do I move along? I just, uh, I just put together this workshop uh, for December 20th, 2020. I put it out to a couple of clients. I said, Hey, is anybody interested if I do this envisionment workshop, which I've done, for myself, twice a year, I check into my values, what's true, I regenerate them. And by Sunday, I had 51 people from all over the world who stepped into this workshop, which was exactly what I just said. It's what was last year about? What did we do every single month? Was it positive? Was it negative? Was it just net some gain? And then what do we want our lives to look like, feel like, be like December 20th, 2021? And then using those values, we basically filter all the things we did in 2020, what should come forward into 2021? And then what's new? What do we want to explore? What do we want to create? And that workshop was such an eye opener to so many people because they had never thought to not just look at the past and look at the future, but to really use them as tools to bring them forward into that next year. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I, I really, what I have gained from what you just said is that so often we focus on the thing. Um, like mm. you said, like, I want that mm. piece of property or the land. I'm guilty of that one. The land, the land, when mm. I have the land. And I think a good question is what's underneath that? What's the craving underneath that? And what does the land represent to you? Yeah, that's such a great, such a great point. I have so many people who call and say, I, I want to be a farmer or I've seen the biggest little farm. <laughs> Let me press the button and get that. <laughs> And it's like, well, let's talk about your values. What do you want? Well, I want to be close to my kids and I want to see them grow up and I want to have clean air and I want to know where my food comes from. Well, if you take a look at those things, you could do that through dumpster diving. And I, I use that example because they're so different. Like one is creating a farm and one is dumpster diving. But, uh, you know, the, the difference between the two and anybody whose farm knows it, it takes a lot of time, money and energy to produce a crop, to get things moving, to start to produce something of value. So it's a really important thing to evaluate what's behind the thing, what's behind the land. What, what is it that you think you'll have once you have that? And when people start saying security or stability, or for folks who think that this is the apocalypse and this is the mm -hmm. lifeboat, 
then great. You know, just be aware that those are the things you're working for. And a farm might be the way to get there. Community living might be the way to get there. Becoming a, a nomad might be the way to get there. There's, there's all of these ways to get there. And then when there is resistance, and there always will be, there will always be parts of us that are resisting the change to disidentify with the emotion. You know, we're 2,600 years after the Buddha, who is still by and far the best psychologist ever on the planet, where disidentification with these cravings, with these, uh, with these aversions, and saying, oh, the, there's a part of me that really wants that, or, oh, I have this feeling of fear inside of me, or this feeling of X inside of me. But that one line, a part of me, when uh, I'm feeling, so, you know, we started this podcast and there were some technical difficulties and there was definitely a part of me that I don't identify with, but a part of me that goes, oh, another, another thing that didn't happen right today. And it was like, I could feel that energy. And I was like, I get that. A part of me feels that way, of course. But the moment you do that, you become sovereign in a, a centered place. You're now, you're coming back to center court so you can move all over the court by saying, oh, I, I recognize a part of me feels that way. And chances are that part has had a trauma in its past and it's had a, a place where it hasn't felt honored or valued because something happened. And, you know, from center, I can go, it's a technical glitch. They happen all the time. They happen to me. So you just stay calm, you acknowledge that part, and then you move forward. So these, these two pieces, these, these pieces of, you know, understand your values, use your values as filters, and then really identify and work with and metabolize these parts have been these two keystones in the work that I do. And mm -hmm. if anybody's interested, you go to allpointsdesign.ca and you, you click on the life tab. And there's all of these tools. If you go to education, there's actually the Envisionment 2021 workshop that's still up if anybody is interested in it. But you can always go back to these simple tools. And that's why I like talking about them and just showing people the step-by-step -step process because they are ridiculously simple, but it's the using of them that actually makes them really effective. Mm, yes, and I can see we're saying it's a part of me. It's not saying I am a failure. Mm. I am this. I am that. Um, it's not total identification with that. And it's the stories. That's what I found in my life. The stories that I tell myself mm. about the facts. Like we did have technical difficulties, a lot of them, and I was freaking out <laughs> earlier. But if I step back and said, okay, it's just technical difficulties. It's, it's not a reflection of who we are, right? who I am as a person. <laughs> and that's what we do. We, oh we identify, we're, we're taught to, and this is, this is part of designing one's life is that if, if we took everything that we were told, it would be that we are what we do, which we aren't. Mm -hmm. And that men can only be valued through their productivity and women can only be valued through, you know, there's such a laundry list of, of garbage oh, yes, identities, yes. Uh, you, how, <laughs> how nurturing you are or how feminine you are. Or how, Do you fit into the pants you were in high school? Right. All of that garbage. It's just 100% grade A garbage. And I find with my male colleagues or my female colleagues that hold a lot of the masculine energy, they'll do that. They'll be like, I didn't do enough today and I'm not a good person because of it. And it's like, wow, you just lose so much ground every time you do that. And that's the way that a corporate meritocracy works in terms of capitalism. You make a box and you say, if you're not in this box, you're not a worthwhile person. You make sure that the person is now identified with that. And then every single time they don't step into it, they go, oh my goodness, I have to go and buy something, do something, increase the GDP to be a good little productivity, a good little body shape, a good, you know, whatever that, that mode model story is. And you lose further ground for yourself, but you gain ground for somebody else. It's this idea of there's always a horse and a cart. The horse is my horsepower to pull me forward and my cart or my dreams, my aspirations, all of those things. The way modern society is set up is so that way they'll hijack your horse. And now all of a sudden your horse power is pulling behind, oh, to make the the best podcast, I have to have these things instead of oh, to make a good podcast, I have to talk about something I'm passionate about. And then as I build a following or I get interest in it, I'll upgrade my gear or I'll upgrade my software. It's, it's pervasive through everything in society. And that's why challenging, 
challenging, questioning, inquiring into the static norms, the things that we're told are important is so essential. And if we don't, chances are we're going to go and live the life that somebody else designed for us instead of the life that we uniquely have the opportunity to live for ourselves. I love that. And so we really have to recognize when our internal capitalist is dictating. <laughs> <laughs> I see my internal capitalist. It tells me all the time, oh, you're not doing enough. Get to work. Mm. Now I think I'm just going to pat him on the head and give him a cup of tea. <laughs> I'll give him some Spilanthes tincture. <laughs> hey, you know, if your pusher is like, you haven't done enough, it's like, tell me about that. How do you feel that? Because the moment you do that, it's like a friend who you know is, you know, they're having such a, a big upset day and you're like, oh, tell me about that. And as they, as they speak it out, you know that they're relaxing because they're, they're identifying less and less with it because they realize some of how ridiculous it is. But then at the end of the day, you give them, sp them s some Spilanthes tincture. That's true. That's <laughs> absolutely what you have to do. Oh, uh, well, thank you so, so much, Javin. Thanks so much. Bye now. Thanks for listening to The Plant Report. The Plant Report is produced by Jill Cloutier and is a project of Sustainable World Radio. For more podcasts about plants, permaculture, and ecology, visit our website, sustainableworldradio.com, and you can also find us on iTunes, Facebook, and Twitter. The Plant Report is created for educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any health condition. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to thank the plants for everything they do.